Welcome to Coffee Break, the live stream series brought to you by Microchip Technology, where our mission is to educate, entertain, and empower you to innovate in your designs. I'm your host, Dana Curtis, and you're watching season 13 of Coffee Break. As always, we're here to dive into the fascinating world of embedded control technologies, integrated circuits, and all things smart, connected, and secure. And about the time it takes to enjoy a fresh cup of coffee. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. Coffee Break is a live broadcast, and we encourage audience participation. But before I introduce our special guest, let's take it over to Aliyah Fahut for some housekeeping items. Leah, what do you got for us? Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are currently live on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And we invite you to participate in today's episode by leaving your questions and comments in the chat or email us at livestream at microchip.com after the broadcast. If you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and subscribe to our channel and click the bell so you know when we're live next. And on LinkedIn, you can subscribe to the event so you can get all information related to the episode. Back to you, Dana. Thank you, Aaliyah. Today we have a very special guest joining us. Mark McComb is a Principal Applications Engineer at Microchip Technology. Welcome, Mark. You are returning you, to Coffee Break to talk about low power capabilities in AVR and PIC microcontrollers, which is a topic of great interest to this audience. We've got our coffee ready, Mark. Let's start with the obvious question. There's often a misconception about what low power means when it comes to these 8-bit platforms. What does low power mean, and why should people? Why might people be confused by that term? Yeah, um, I think there's um, a misconception out there that, um, first of all, nowadays, that everything can be solved in software, and there are some great devices out there that can solve things in software very quickly, very efficiently, and in a low power fashion. However, 8-bit PIC and AVR devices uh, feature a lot of hardware integration onto them that allow you to achieve these low power states. So I think the misperception just comes from not understanding that there are all these different tools that the engineer has at their disposal. And there's kind of a right tool for the job. And hopefully at the end of this coffee break, uh, you'll see some of the values that PIC and AVR bring. Great. Great. Let's go to some visuals that we have here, Mark. Uh, where would you like to begin? Yeah, so uh, just discussing some of these capabilities that you'd find on these uh, lower power devices. Um, we have the ability to kind of mitigate the amount of power consumed by turning various features off on the device and, and flexibly so. So you can control whether or not the central processing unit is on certain clocks on the device we can turn off and on dynamically. Uh, there's peripherals on these products that offer uh, a lot of options when it comes to dynamically switching these products on and off or these peripheral features on and off. Um, a lot of these peripherals can operate in lower power states. Uh, so if you did have the CPU off or a lot of the clocks off or in some of these lower power modes, you can take advantage of that and still have logic being implemented in the background. So when we talk about dynamically enabling or disabling digital and analog peripherals at runtime, can you elaborate on that? I mean, is that available with all devices? Well, uh, I think, you know, you have a peripheral on a microcontroller. Uh, you also have a central processing unit and the ability to go in and and most of these peripherals or features you can turn off or on at runtime. Uh, recently, uh, PIC and EVR devices have introduced some uh, more optimized methods of doing this. So for example, we have one uh, peripheral capability called the peripheral module disable. And oftentimes when you turn off some peripherals, uh, clocks and, and other uh, data lines are still kind of connected to the peripheral and you're going to get some level of leakage current. What the peripheral module disable allows you to do is actually turn those peripherals off as if they were never even in the circuit. So it just gives you a little more optimization when it comes to uh, leakage currents and things like that by mitigating that. We also have a new peripheral uh, on our uh, PIC 18 f Q71 family members called the Analog Peripheral Manager. And what this peripheral allows you to do is is to dynamically turn 
peripherals that are related to analog. So things like analog to digital converters and op amps and digital to analog converters. These these peripherals are traditionally kind of a, a big source of leakage currents and things like that. But with this analog peripheral manager, uh, based on a clock within uh, the system and a variety of clocks, you can actually enable or disable the analog capabilities oftentimes while the device is in one of these lower power states. So you mentioned clocks, that brings us to our next visual here. Uh, in terms of clock options and operation modes, how to pick an AVR devices provide flexibility for engineers to optimize power usage? Oh, sounds like we have Mark back. Mark? I'm here. Okay. Hopefully the audio is better. I, it allowed me to go get another cup of coffee. Excellent. That's what we do here. Yeah. Okay, so we talked about multiple options for external and internal clocks, and then we kind of got to dynamic switching, I believe, and we started having some audio trouble. Do you want to pick up where you left off talking about dynamic switching? Sure. Um, now, because we have all of these different clock options on the devices, and we have a central processing unit, what this means is that we can switch between these different clock sources. So maybe there's a point in the application where you need something a little more precise, uh, so you would use maybe a more precise clock. Uh, maybe there's times when you don't need that precision and you can move to an internal clock or a, a clock that actually has, um, consumes a little less power. You can almost think of it as the more precision you have with the clock, the more power you're going to consume. But the other option here is that we're going to want to go into these lower power modes and the more precise clock you use, there's going to be a wake up time associated with that. So that means that you're going to have to give that more precise clock, like an external oscill oscillator, crystal oscillator, the opportunity to settle. And that's going to take some time. So everything is going to contribute to the amount of time you're going to be consuming more current. And that's just going to contribute to the overall, overall power consumption. Now, um, I don't know if we caught the automatic clock tuning uh, portion of this, but this this is a feature that we have on PIC and AVR devices that allow us to use something like, say, a, uh, an external clock, a CAN clock crystal on the outside of the device and use it as a reference. So uh, I kind of mentioned, you know, synchronizing your watch, uh, you know, in the old spy movies and that, uh, but that's kind of what it's doing. The internal oscillator, you can use uh, a lower power internal oscillator and use this external clock as a reference. And automated hardware is going to go back and just make sure that the internal clock is running uh, as close as possible or using that as the timing source. And just to help improve the accuracy of the clock on the inside of the device, because they're not going to have that accuracy that you do get on the outside of, uh, or the uh, external types of clocks. Okay, and that brings us back to core independent peripherals. So let's talk about core independent peripherals and why that's important. Yeah, so uh, if you take a look at more processing centric devices, so if you, and microchip sells all of these. So we have 32 bit devices, we have 16 bit uh, devices with digital, uh, with digital signal control capabilities. These devices all feature hardware that allow them to uh, execute code very quickly so they can do some advanced math capabilities. PIC and AVR have some of that, but not to that extent. Where the focus is, is more on the peripheral side of things. And what they do is they offload the central processing unit. So when I say core independent peripherals, I just mean there's more of a focus on adding more automation into these peripherals. An example would be uh, an analog to digital converter with computation. Uh, you'll find these on both PIC and EVR devices. And what they do is they take some of the task handling that you used to write software for, so to do things like averaging or filtering, and move it on to the peripheral. And what this allows the peripheral to do is execute this while the CPU is either doing something else in tandem or maybe in a lower power state. And then whenever that averaging or that computation has been achieved, then the hardware can notify the central processing unit or store that information for later use when the CPU needs to use it and generate an interrupt 
uh, wake the device, and then the CPU can deal with that information as it needs. So the, the, the whole goal here is to focus less on writing software and focus more on automating within hardware. And there's times when you should use this, uh, there's times when you shouldn't use this, and, and a more processing-centric device is more appropriate. So again, these are just engineering decisions that are going to uh, need to be made. But again, we have all of these tools so that the customer can choose what's best for their application to keep it optimized for both low power and how responsive it is. Great, thanks Mark. Uh, appreciate you coming back and I apologize again about the audio. At this point, we'd no like reason. to go over to Aliyah and see what we have on our Q&A. Other than notifications about Mark's audio, Aliyah, what else do we have? Yes, uh, we do have a question on LinkedIn from Emil. How do low power modes on the PIC devices compare to those on the AVR devices? Right, so both devices are going to feature the ability to um, adjust how the CPU is used, how the clocks are used, and how the peripherals are used, and give you kind of like flexibility to turn these on more or less uh, during uh, the application. They're just going to be called differently on these devices. So on PIC, you're going to have things like doze mode, idle mode, and sleep mode. And sleep mode, which is the uh, deepest possible uh, power mode, or the lowest power mode that you can achieve. On AVR devices, you're going to have things like idle mode, standby mode, power down mode, and you're going to have these capabilities called sleepwalking which just means that you're going to have the ability to have select peripherals wake the device from this lower power state. And that's the same on the PIC. You have those capabilities as well. It's just named differently. That's great. Thank you, Mark. The next question I have for you is from YouTube. This is from Rowan. Uh, what are some of the trade-offs between using smaller process technologies for MCUs and the potential for increased power leakage and heat vulnerability? Right, so um, when you, uh, there's, there's trade-offs with regards to power consumption, uh, just in the fact that if you're using a uh, process technology that's a little bit smaller, you're going to have things closer together. So you're gonna wind up uh, with a little more leakage current possible um, on uh, the transistors that are within the device. However, there's also a benefit to having this lower process technology where you can use um, lower voltage levels on these devices. So if you look at both of those parameters, current and voltage, these play, any engineer would tell you, play an important role in any type of uh, low power application. The 8-bit devices, uh, because they just naturally have a larger architecture, are a little less susceptible to leakage current. Uh, the 32-bit devices and, and more processing-centric devices because they can use these lower power modes uh, or these uh, these lower voltage levels are a little less susceptible to power consumption in that regard. So again, this is going to be a uh, an engineering decision based on what you need to do. So if you need to do a lot of processing, you need to do a lot of math, you have a lot of libraries, 8-bit is not the way to go. However, if there's some unique advantages on the 8-bit device that you can take advantage of, so some of that integrated analog, uh, the, the basic motor control and LED uh, drive capabilities, the functional safety capabilities, the, the hardware peripheral capabilities, then that may be the device to go with. Awesome, thank you, Mark. The next question I have for you is um, from Oscar, and he's wondering if you can provide an example of a task that benefits from parallel task handling in these MCUs. Yes, um, so let's use, say, an AVR as an example. So the AVR devices, um, the modern AVR devices from Microchip have uh, this thing on them called the event system. And what the event system allows you to do is to take and route different signals from different peripherals on the device to other peripherals on the device and cause things to happen. So for example, uh, a parallel uh, example of multitasking could be uh, the core of the AVR is handling maybe some communication over the I squared C bus. Uh, and at the same time, the uh, comparator peripheral on the device is monitoring an input. And then whenever that input goes above a certain voltage, it can trigger uh, 
uh, an output that is routed through the event system to an analog to digital converter, which then computes the uh, analog voltage on that pin and then averages it and then holds that information for the CPU when it's done that I squared C transaction. Uh, if you didn't have that event system or that capability, you would have to do each one of those processes uh, where the, the comparator would go off and then you would have to trigger the A to D and that would be the responsibility of the central processing unit. So having that event system, you can actually do both at the same time. Thanks, Mark. Um, last question from you is uh, from LinkedIn from Yara. Can you explain how hardware-based task handling in PIC and AVR MCUs reduces power consumption compared to software-based task handling? Yes. Uh, so now, now again, there's there's a caveat here. There's certain functions that the 32-bit or the uh, the the higher-end processors can do that the 8-bit cannot. So again, if you're doing that math, uh, you know there's really nice hardware on these devices. The the SAM and the PIC32 devices, the DS PIC devices, that allow you to execute that code very quickly. Now. If you were to offload, say, some of the software components to the hardware, so again, with that analog to digital converter, with the ability to do that, um, that computation on the device or on the peripheral itself, you can mitigate that software that needs to be executed. And you can get rid of things like uh, software latency. So whenever you execute a, an interrupt or you, you call a function in software, there's a period of time where the central processing unit needs to jump to a different section of memory and read that information. And there's a latency involved with that. If you're dealing with hardware, and I'll use the uh, configurable logic that's on these products um, as an example, if you're going to make a decision based on an input, and, and albeit they're, they're, they're basic decisions, uh, you're dealing with the propagation delay through hardware, which can be on the order of nanoseconds. In order to execute that quickly on a, a device that's reliant on the software or on the clocks, you'd have to run these things at possibly hundreds of megahertz. So these, again, are just trade-offs. If, if the, if the PIC or AVR has that feature on it that you can take advantage of, then definitely that's the device to go. If you're doing things like image processing or you're going to require a lot of uh, intense software or your company has a lot of software libraries that it wants to repurpose, then you definitely want to take a look at the more processing-centric devices. Again, different tools for different jobs. Well, those are all the questions I have for you today. Again, thank you, Mark, for answering the questions. And for our audience, if you have additional questions or comments, you can email us at livestream at microchip.com. And don't forget to follow us on LinkedIn and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Back to you, Dana. Thank you, Aaliyah. Uh, again, apologize to the audience for the audio, but the website to go to here is microchip.com forward slash CIPS. That's core independent peripheral, plural, more than one, CIPS. Uh, well, audio aside, Mark, I think that was worth the coffee. So I okay. want to extend a big thank you to our special guest for sharing his knowledge and passion with us today. It's conversations like these that remind us of the endless possibilities empowering your innovation in the world of embedded control and processing. <coughs> Again, you can visit us at microchip.com forward slash coffee break. Click on the subscribe button to get updates for all things coffee break. You can also see upcoming episodes for season 13. And of course, be sure to join us next time on coffee break as we explore space power solutions for traditional and new space. All about space next episode. That episode will live stream on Wednesday, July 17th. Until then, stay curious, stay creative. Stay caffeinated. <laughs>